Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow colleagues in the media industry, our key stakeholders from government as well as business joining us in the room as well as virtually. Welcome to the 2022 launch of the old mutual savings and investment monitor. My name is Fifi Peters, really delighted to be with you all today for the launch and to facilitate the session. Really appreciate your time today, uh, particularly my colleagues in the media industry. I know that today is a pretty hectic news day, quite a lot going on, and uh, really appreciate the fact that you have chosen this event as one of the events that you will uh, be covering today. So as you know, the uh, OMSIM report, Old Mutual Savings and Investment uh, Monitor, it looks at the relationship uh, that South Africans have with their money, how they are feeling about their financial situation and how they are feeling about the uh, economy. And uh, yeah, things pretty precarious when it does come to the financial situation part of things right now because of inflation and the fact that prices of practically everything are going through the roof, pretty scary stuff. I think that many of you right now would have seen the latest numbers that uh, were dropped by statistics. South Africa inflation now at a 13 year high uh, the price of poloni doing crazy things, in fact, the most expensive in the meat basket. So inflation pressure is really making it difficult to have that money set aside at the end of the month to channel towards savings as well, of course, as well as, of course, interest rates. Well, if you are already a saver, interest rates are benefiting you. We do know that the uh, path for those is higher. Uh, we'll probably hear a little bit more about that tomorrow when the Reserve Bank makes its latest interest rate decision, but that's a conversation, of course, for tomorrow. So today it really is about learning all there is to know from the latest OMSIM uh, report as it does pertain to how, far, how South Africans are reviewing their financial situations right now, how they're managing their uh, money. You'll, of course, know that July is also... Uh, savings month and therefore uh, all kinds of pearls of financial wisdom that uh, can capacitate us to make better decisions about our money today and tomorrow certainly welcome because as the saying goes knowledge is power and uh, when you know more uh, or know better you certainly do better so just a few housekeeping uh, rules before we do begin a few notes rather no need to be that formal uh so everything that will be shared today will be recorded and uh will be available on the uh, old mutual websites at a uh, later stage i imagine that you won't have to wait too long for that so that is the actual live recording of the session that you are logged into and some of you are here today uh, physically attending as well as the uh, the notes the uh, investment monitor the OMSIM 2022 report in itself that will be available online. There's quite a number of gems that you're going to hear as it does pertain to the behavior of South Africans with their money, uh, positive steps that they have made in the past year and some uh, worrying aspects and do feel free to share insights of those with uh, your community. Tweet away on social media the hashtag uh, to use to do so is no better do better. There'll also be uh, a formal section towards the end uh, for you to pose any questions to the speakers that you will be hearing from who will be interrogating the report from different aspects. So feel free to do so. Send them through on the uh, chat function and we'll get to as many as time does allow towards the end of the session and make sure that all of your uh, questions uh, are answered. And of course, we will also be taking questions from uh, the floor here today. So with that said, uh, not wasting any more time, I'd like to uh, hand over to the CEO of Old Mutual, Mr. Ian Williamson, for his opening remarks as it does pertain to the release of this year's OMSIM report. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the 2022 Old Mutual Savings and Investment Monitor launch. Unfortunately, I couldn't be in the same room with you today, but I'm excited that we're once again able to share the findings of this important study with you. We've been tracking the savings and investment habits of households quite closely since 2009. 
And that's because these households represent our customer base. And so we have a vested interest in understanding the things that impact their financial behavior over time. Our responsibility in all of this is to ensure the financial well-being of our customers throughout their lifetimes. And in fact, it forms part of our purpose of championing mutually positive futures every day. And we do this through a comprehensive financial education program called On The Money, which is designed to give customers the tools to make the most appropriate financial decisions for themselves and their families. So with every round of the Old Mutual Savings and Investment Monitor, our commitment to ensuring the financial well-being of the communities we serve grows. I'm certain that you will find this year's OMSIM findings both fascinating and valuable, and that we can continue working together to be part of the solution on behalf of South African consumers. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks to you, Ian. So uh, you will all uh, probably remember that uh, what the pandemic did, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it uh, changed the attitudes of quite a number of uh, individuals all over the world uh, as, it did, as it did pertain to how they manage their money. I think everyone was just, you know, dealt a blow by the shock that the pandemic introduced to their ability to earn and started looking at money differently and relating to money a lot more differently. All over the world, we did see the uh, level of savings increase, even here in South Africa. And I'm certainly looking forward to seeing if this year's report does uh, represent a continuation of that changed behavior, or if there's a slight deviation, and if so, why. But we'll, we'll find that out a little later when we get into the actual report itself. But of course, when we talk about investments, you can't talk about investments without looking at what the market is uh, doing. And to give us a bird's eye view, uh, give us the macroeconomic picture of the markets right now and the economy and uh, how it does relate to some of the findings of uh, the 2022 uh, OMSIM report. Heading over to uh, Cape Town, where I believe quite a number of my media colleagues are dialed in uh, today, but heading over there, where uh, Isaac Odendal is also there. He is the uh, investment strategist at Old Mutual Multi Managers, and he's standing by to give us the lay of the land as it does pertain to the markets and the economy. Isaac, good morning, over to you. Hi, good morning. Yeah, so certainly it's been it's been a very interesting um, and difficult year so far. If we if we just step back to January. Um, you know, there was a general sense of optimism around the world, around the state of the world economy about exiting COVID uh, and finally putting it behind us, as, as you mentioned, Fifi. But since then, we've had, uh, you know, inflation just going up um, and the growth outlook has just come come down, way down. Um, and I think we all understand the reasons why inflation has, has shot up. Inflation has been persistently high. Um, that eats into people's ability to spend. They have to spend more on food and oil um, and, and, and necessities, and there's less money to spend on everything else. And, uh, and that just is a drag on, on growth. At the same time, of course, you have central banks responding quite forcefully to high inflation. They are worried um, that inflation will become entrenched, that it'll become self-fulfilling, and that it'll become permanent. So you've seen this really since the start of the year, um, very, very aggressive and, and synchronized hiking cycle. Um, this chart shows you the major developed central banks. Um, you can see very big moves in interest rates, particularly notably from the US. That's the most important central bank in the world. Um, they're sitting at one and three quarters percent, probably going up all the way to about three, three and a half percent by the end of the year. If you look at emerging markets, uh, interest rates have been going up even more and even faster. So a country like Brazil started the year at 4%. Central bank there has taken it all the way up to 13 to above 13%. So, so sharp increases in interest rates is going to have a negative impact on, um, on consumer demand and on spending um, and therefore on global growth um, as a whole. And of course, they're all multiple uncertainties. You know, we don't know how the war in Ukraine is going to evolve. Um, that could still impact the world economy um, in unpredictable ways, particularly in Europe. So you're seeing a lot more talk around uh, the, the, the odds of a recession, 
Uh, many respected global economists are saying it's 50-50 whether we, we hit, hit the recession or not. One of the key things um, that will that argues against a recession, um, and I'm bringing this up because it is savings month and we are talking about savings today, um, and, and, and therefore savings might still save us, um, is, is that these big savings buffers that households have built up um, in the rich countries. Um, so this is the example of the US news. Look at the, the, the value of bank deposits jumped up from a trillion to about four trillion during during the pandemic. So um, big savings buffers, households can draw on those savings in these in these tough and uncertain times. Obviously, um, big as these numbers are, they're not infinite. So if inflation persists and interest rates really keep going up, um, you know, they're going to run out of savings eventually, and then you really are looking at a at a recession scenario. So so certainly tough, um, a tough environment and a, and a, and a gloomy outlook, um, at least for the next couple of months. And, and no surprise then that markets have been under severe pressure. So this is just the global equity index down about 20 percent since the start of the year. You know, pricing in higher interest rates, high inflation, um, slower growth. Again, I would imagine that uh, markets will still be volatile for some time as we kind of try and price in, you know, the, the, the scenarios as they as they evolve. Um, South African financial markets have been slightly more resilient, um, but but also negative uh, year to date if you look at local local equities and, and local bonds. So it's been a tough time for for investors, but, you know, it has to be said that also follows uh, 2021 was a was a pretty spectacular year for for investments. If we just then move locally, local economy, I think it's been a story of recovering from COVID uh, much faster than expected. The COVID shock was the worst this economy has experienced in um, in more than 100 years. And um, you know, back in 2020, there was an expectation that recovery would take maybe four or five years. But uh, in the first quarter of this year, real GDP, the blue line on this chart, actually hit. Uh, the pre-pandemic level. So we've we've kind of uh, re recovered back to pre-pandemic levels. If you look at that's the total economy, but obviously certain sectors are still uh, in in deep trouble um, and still and still struggling to recover. And specifically, if you look at employment, which is the green line on this chart, um, you, you know that has not recovered yet. Um, it looks a little bit better than it was, but um, you know, we're still sitting with about a million fewer jobs than we did uh, on the eve of the pandemic. And that obviously implies that uh, inequality in this country, when inequality is already so high, has just has just worsened. So that is that is a that is a sad story. Um, the good news is that overall household incomes have been quite resilient. This is Reserve Bank data looking at disposable income um, in nominal terms. So we don't take into account inflation here, but you can just see that we've recovered the COVID shock, um, and we kind of back to that pre-COVID growth trend. So that's obviously good news. Households are much more resilient than we thought. Um, incomes have kept pace. Those of us who have maintained our jobs and our businesses are still running and so on, uh, you know, we're doing okay. It's, it's, it's the people who have obviously lost their jobs that are that are really, really struggling. Now, clearly, this will now have to be stretched much further because, you know, as you mentioned, inflation is now six, seven and a half percent, record petrol prices, etc. So we would expect consumer spending to slow in the months ahead. The one thing that's really helped our economy, of course, is, is commodity prices. Uh, the green line here is an index of South Africa's main commodity exports. So that's gold, iron or coal, very important coal um, and, and, and the platinum metals. Um, and you can see that this, it's been volatile and it's, it's actually come down in recent months, but we're still well below pre-pandemic levels. So this has really given our economy a shot in the arm at a, at a, at a really at a crucial stage um, and continues to support the economy um, as we speak. Um, so that is that is that is still very important. Um, a bit of good news on this chart, the dotted line is the oil price. You can see that oil price has actually come come down quite a bit in recent weeks. So so there is light at the end of the tunnel in terms of the uh, the big global fuel price increases that the consumers everywhere are, are facing. Um, 
And then just finally, if we look at the inflation, so this chart is a little bit out of date because the CPI number came out minutes ago. Uh, the dotted line is CPI. It's now sitting at above 7%, the headline number. Um, the green line is the inflation, sorry, is the, is the Reserve Bank's repo rate. Um, in an environment that I spoke about where global central banks are all raising interest rates, the Reserve Bank is not going to be left alone or will be left on its own. So we're going to see more rate hikes coming through. I would expect 50 basis points um, tomorrow and probably a repo rate taking us to around 6% uh, by the end of the year. Although inflation is very high in South Africa, that's mainly driven by food and fuel. Um, those aren't items that the Reserve Bank can control at all. So, so the focus is more on how those prices impact other prices, you know, the so-called second round effect. We're not seeing major evidence of second round effects in South Africa just yet. So I don't think the Reserve Bank needs to be as aggressive as central banks in um, in, in in the West, in the, in the rich countries. So so just just to just to sort of a final uh, snippet is that if you look at where inflation in the UK, that number came out this morning as well, that's at 9.4 percent. So, so two percentage points above South Africa in the UK and the US is also 9 percent. So for the first time in a long time, a very long time, we have inflation rates in the in the developed countries that are higher than in South Africa. So yeah, that is um, that talks to uh, we, you know the Reserve Bank not having to go into panic stations just yet. Um, so to summarize, global growth outlook has weakened substantially. There is a risk of a global recession, um, and unfortunately, that's that's been you know the, the story of the last six months. Um, equity markets, bond markets globally have been under big pressure, as you would imagine. And as I said, I would expect volatility to to be a feature for for the next couple of months. Yeah, but. Uh, it's, it's not all doom and gloom. You've got those savings buffers in, in, in the rich countries. And in South Africa, I think there's been a general resilience amongst uh, consumers. Uh, that has been a positive surprise coming out of um, coming out of COVID. Now that resilience will be tested. Um, certainly with with all the with all the headwinds facing facing the economy. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not we're not seeing um, any kind of recession risks on the horizon for for South Africa at this stage. So with that, I will uh, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much, Isaac. I suppose adding to that ESCOM behaving, uh, yeah, to minimize those recession risks. And it is quite interesting, as Isaac said, we're digesting the inflation numbers that have come out. 7.4% uh, we were last year in 2009, so that's the global financial crisis at times, uh, pretty high. And uh, as uh, Isaac did say, I mean, in terms of what is happening and the risks around recession, uh, perhaps the savings and the resiliency of the consumers in developed worlds, like uh, the US will help offset the blow a bit. An interesting fact, so many of you will know that uh, US companies are reporting their uh, earnings right now for the previous quarter, the second quarter. And it's interesting to see that even though prices are going up there, inflation at 9.1%, as we've just heard, uh, the consumers, they are still buying. I mean, if you take into account what Levi's did, they increased the prices of their jeans, yet consumers are still buying. And even Pepsi, so the guys that makes the drinks and the Doritos chips and Fritos and all of that, they pushed in a 12% increase in their product and consumers are still munching away at their snacks. But then you, you contrast that with what you have seen here locally, the latest retail sales print for uh, South Africa uh, showed a different kind of picture. I mean, retail sales kind of like did nothing in the month of June, didn't really grow. Uh, you looked at what consumers were doing. They're buying a whole lot of food, obviously. I mean, we have to eat to survive. But they are cutting back a bit uh, when it does come to clothing. They bought a lot less clothes and a lot less uh, shoes. So, so even though we're talking about inflation uh, right now and the fact that interest rates are increasing and are expected to increase, uh, we have kind of been in a rising interest rate environment for a while. It started late last year when the Reserve Bank started increasing interest rates. So consumers have had time to position, I suppose, for, for this eventuality and this new normal. And therefore, I think it will really be interesting to see how they have positioned, realigned themselves for an environment of higher prices and an environment whereby it costs a lot more to service their debt if they do have because of interest rates. So to speak more then to the report, the methodology that was used this uh, time around and the key 
findings, I would like to now uh, welcome on stage Vuyokazi Mabude. She's the Head of Knowledge and Insights at Old Mutual for more details. Vuyo. Thank you. Um, thanks, Fifi, and thank you to Isak. I think it was a great intro into what I'm going to share today. Um, so I think just starting out, just reflecting on how we actually conduct um, the OMSIM study. I think Ian mentioned in his video, we've been doing it since 2009, and we've refined the approach since then. So we do it annually, just in South Africa at the moment. It's an online survey, obviously, because partially because of COVID, in fact, um, and the ability to reach the audience that we're looking for. We sample just over 1,500 people, and mainly people with an income of 8,000 rand and above. Um, and we do a dip check in terms of people earning between 1,000 to 8,000 rand to get that holistic picture. And then all of that data is weighted to the working population in South Africa. So our focus is really working South Africans and understanding their behavior and their attitudes towards saving and investments. So just starting out, I think, kind of linking back to where Isaac was in, in his presentation, when we look at the sentiment um, about the South African economy, what we find is only 33% of people are confident in the South African economy as, at this moment in time. Obviously, this is stable versus the previous year, um, as you can see, 34 to 33. However, still very muted pre versus pre-COVID times. And this is not surprising. So when you look at the things that have impacted um, that sentiment, it's not a surprise to see just how much South Africans have had to deal with and take in in the last um, year and a bit. And so moving into the key indicators then of what we see within, within OMSIM for this year, what we were surprised to find is that actually kind of le leading on from 2021, where those signs of people starting to adjust to the new normal, starting to move into um, a slight recovery and resilience, is that actually this has just become more evident in 2022. So what you're looking at now is that actually the percentage of people who are saying they're earning less and significantly less has actually dropped significantly. So from 53% down to 34%. Obviously not all good news because you have one in three still earning less now versus pre-pandemic, but this is still, we think, um, a really good signal and a, a sign that recovery is starting to happen and people are slowly starting to move forward and financially. Also, you're seeing an increase in people who are earning more. This could be driven by young people who have started new jobs, obviously. Um, and so we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're excited, I think, to see that recovery and resilience start to come through. Um, and it's combined, I think, with two other things. So the one is less financial stress, and the other is, is optimism, which I'll show in just a second. But if you look on the right-hand side of this chart, you'll start to see that decline in people who were completely overwhelmed in terms of financial stress, down from 56 to 50%. So it is trending in the right direction. You know, and, and I think Isaac mentioned this um, when he talked as well. Obviously, once you start to look at lower income, older consumers, this trend is not as, as positive. So people are really still under a lot of financial stress at a lower income band. And then finally, looking at the financial outlook. And again, this is not the economic outlook. This is personal, individual financial outlook for the next six months. This for us was really great to see is that people are still quite optimistic about where they will be in the next six months financially. And a part of that is because, and, and, and I think we've, we may have mentioned the stat already, a large number of people have taken their finances and, and have taken a different approach um, in terms of how they're approaching their finances. And so you're seeing that 72% of people actually think their finances will improve in the next six months and quite optimistic. And similarly, a really nice to see actually a huge decline in people who were quite pessimistic about their personal finances, down from 21% to just 5% in 2022. So we're seeing that really nice um, declining trend of people who thought things would get worse for them financially. And then a big part of this actually onto how people are probably remaining optimistic and managing their stress is that people have taken control of their finances. Everything that's in their sphere of control on their spending, they have drastically reduced 
um, certain things and they're rigorously managing their money. And you can see on the right hand side, cheaper streaming options, using rewards programs, giving up gym memberships, which, you know, let's see how, <laughs> I think uh, Tabby was talking earlier about running at 5 a.m. I think a lot of us are having to take different initiative um, and make sacrifices, but step in, in into different spaces. And then similarly, you're seeing poly jobbers, which was a trend that was actually highlighted in the 2021 results, has actually increased from 47% to 51%. And so those are people de depending on multiple income streams. So managing money, one on the one side in terms of spending, but also starting to find new income streams as well. And then just lastly, when we talk about what's on people's mind right now, um, when it comes to their finances, you can see in the big green, saving is a really, really big uh, part of that. Um, and again, we saw this in 2021, a lot of people had recognized the need for saving and they're actually starting to take action and we're seeing that come through in the 2022 results. And so just stepping into that. So firstly, I think, and, and the stat I think is one of those numbers that stays with you. 86% of people have said that COVID-19 has impacted the way they think about money and the way they manage their finances. That is a huge, that's nine in 10. So in, even in this room, nine out of 10 people are saying they actually would change, have changed the way that they manage their money and think about their money. And that is then uh, being reflected in their priorities and their behavior. So on the left-hand side, you have the top six priorities for, for people at the moment financially. The first three, I think, you know, are no surprise, job security and income security, cutting expenses, paying debts, and then you start to see all of the savings and emergency savings um, priorities come, come through. So investments, getting better returns, all of them increasing and on the upward uh, trend, which is great to see. And then finally, I think, which is something which, again, probably speaks to the, the financial shock that people suffered through 2020 and 2021 the number of people or the percentage of people who have a three-month savings buffer or more has increased from 27% in 2020 to 39% in 2022. So again, you get that sense that people are readying themselves for whatever may come financially and making so all of those sacrifices where they were cutting down on expenses is actually starting to come through in their savings behavior as well. Then on the second last thing we'll be looking at, so we asked people and started to look at kind of how inclined are they to take risks when it comes to financial decisions. And what we found actually is that South Africans think they're quite, you know, um, their risk inclination is quite high. So one in two think they're actually quite happy to take risks. Um, people are starting to look for better returns. So that's the motivation behind their risk inclination. And you can see in the stat at the bottom, about six in 10, um, are likely to invest in cryptocurrency in the next year. Um, and then I think the flip side of that, of that risk inclination is you're seeing online gambling, and this is the first time that we've looked at this, so we don't have this data trended, but this number for us was a bit alarming in terms of 44% of people gambling online and quite regularly, so either daily or two to three times a week. Um, and one of the key motivators for that gambling online is actually to make ends meet. And so what that says to us is it's, and again, you see it quite more so for people earning less than 8,000 Rand. What that says to us is people are taking risks as a means of survival. Um, and that could have a really, you know, uh, impact on their long-term financial situations. And it's something that we're gonna be looking at obviously as, as we do OMSIM over the next couple of years. But that was something that quite, quite jumped out at us as a potential risk is engaging in online gambling to make ends meet is something that's kind of becoming a part of how South Africans are managing their money. And then we looked at their financial confidence in the decisions that they make and how that is correlated to behavior. So I won't talk to the actual numbers on the chart, but what we're seeing is that the more financially confident someone is, the less financially stressed they are and the more likely they are to save. The reverse is also true. So the less confident the more stressed and the less likely they are to save. So there's this real relationship that's happening between confidence in decisions financially, as well as behavior as a part of that. And, and again, this is something that John will speak to when we talk about financial education, but this relationship for us was quite interesting to see coming out of the back end of the COVID pandemic. 
And then we looked at you know, how are people actually, as part of their savings, we, we started to see this emergence of people needing to keep a life raft for emergencies. So, and I think you'll remember from a previous chart, 37% of people said one of their top priorities is having emergency savings. And how that's playing out is actually a sharp increase in people keeping unbanked cash. Um, so rising from 40% in 2021 to 48% in 2022. And that really is motivated by needing to have money immediately accessible with no penalties um, and no restrictions in terms of how they can use it. And on the right hand side, you start to see a bit of those whys. So all of these three figures are trending downwards, which is positive. However, you still have half of South Africans, working South Africans, dipping into their savings to make ends meet. 40% are borrowing money from friends and family, and 25% are falling behind on store cards and even credit cards, etc. So really that unbanked cash is being driven by some of those, those um, ma uh, matters around either needing your savings to make ends meet or to loan money or borrow money from, from family. So that for us is really something around that, that unbanked cash and the priorities that people are, are potentially trying to use it for um, is something that we'll be, we'll be looking at. And John, again, will speak to a bit of, of this. And then lastly, looking at stock fills, and this, all of the data that you're looking at now is particularly for black South Africans. So the number of people within, you know, joining stock fills is quite stable. So that number hasn't shifted um, just over 50%. However, what we have seen is the incidence of people belonging to more than one stock fell has more than doubled since 2017, and their monthly contributions have increased. So you've got 63% of people now having more than one stock fell, um, and that's double you know, what it was in 2017. So that saving behavior definitely coming through, and people are re definitely reaching out to their more informal um, means of, of saving and accessing money, and stock fills are one of those priority places. The great resignation trend was something we explored because globally this is, this is emergent and actually um, quite you know, uh, rising in terms of, of its, its popularity. And what we found is actually despite high unemployment, it is starting to emerge in South Africa as well. So very, very limited in, in its reach and scope. So one in four have left their jobs since the beginning of COVID, and one in 10 did so voluntarily. What we found interesting was that the reasons people gave to leave their job were not just money. So it was career development or pursuing new skills, well-being, um, and even pursuing their dreams. So really just starting to emerge. Obviously, for the lower end of the market, this is not the case. but we are starting to definitely see the great resignation come through, and we will be keeping an eye on this in the future um, editions of OMSIM. And then retirement reform, just quickly looking at this. So this was just a reaction to the proposal on retirement reform. And what we found is 50% of people are quite positive about it. And, and we'll look at a bit in, in, in a second on the reasons, but mainly for most people, the reason behind wanting to actually think positively about this is getting access to the money and being able to be flexible about how you look at your, um, your pension and the investments or potentially looking at how can I get better returns uh, on, my, on my pension fund um, or retirement annuity. And again, John will, will speak a bit to this, but we found that from a proposal perspective, either mixed or positive responses from people, but there are portions of 12% kind of seeing the negative side on you know, this could have a long-term impact on people, funds would be misused, potentially, you know, scams and that kind of thing. So that was the, just to round up on retirement reform, we won't get too much into it. John will speak to a bit of this. Um, and then just lastly, a quick recap. I won't run through all of these, but I think overall our story is that definitely the resilience that consumers have shown in 2020 and 2021 is starting to show those signs of recovery in 2022. They are very optimistic as well about their potential financial outlook. They're focused on building reserves and savings so that they can have uh, you know, that emergency fund and access to their money. People are open to taking financial risks, largely driven by the fact that they want higher, quicker returns. Um, great resignation is starting to emerge, but not on the levels of what you would see in the US or the UK. And then lastly, there is a strong relationship between financial confidence, sorry, confidence in financial decisions and your behavior in terms of saving as well. 
Um, and that's the whistle stop tour of the 2022 OMSIM highlights. We will definitely share more details. Um, as mentioned, I think Fifi mentioned they'll be on the website. Um, and thank you. All right, thanks so much. Great insights, uh, Voyo. I think uh, my key takeaway is just great and encouraging to see that our salaries, most of our salaries are recovering from the uh, pandemic. In fact, a lot of us are even earning a lot more than they did uh, before the pandemic, which is also really great. It's also good to see that a lot more saving is taking place, a lot more saving for a rainy day, although a bit problematic to see that gambling is uh, becoming a thing right now. But I, I imagine we'll be hearing a little bit more about that uh, in our Q&A. But just essentially just in the main. So consumers are a lot more optimistic about their financial situation, quite a contrast to the economic picture, which doesn't look as uh, rosy. But again, I suppose we'll be drilling into uh, those divergences a little later in the Q&A. A uh, young reminder to send through some of your questions if you do have. Uh, we have uh, some trickling in already. Uh, those of you who are thinking whether to start now or when the Q&A session opens up formally, uh, start now uh, so we can have a lot more time to uh, get uh, through them. And again, just uh, share any insights you uh, think are cool that you've heard so far on social media. The hashtag is no better, uh, do better. In terms of knowing better, I think we have a bit more of an understanding of the lay of the land as it does come to our finances and how we are relating to them. But to bring it home for us and uh, really share some practical tips about how we can uh, improve on our situations a lot further, uh, William made reference to John quite a bit, and so now you get to meet this John if you don't yet know him. John Mayike, the uh, Head of Financial Education at Old Mutual. So, it's your time. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, my job is simple. I'm here to answer the so what question. I think we've got brilliant insights, but in the final analysis, we need to be saying, if I'm a consumer and I'm constrained, or I, if I observe these trends, what should I do? I'm like that uncle that comes at the end of the funeral to summarize the proceedings of the day, and then of ultimately invite people to the after tier celebration. <laughs> so, we've seen that 86% of our people are saying COVID has changed the way they think about money. It's changed the way they, they manage their finances. I think that's all well uh, good. However, it doesn't replace the fact that you still need to speak to a financial advisor. I think the danger with um, being overly confident to a point where you don't have expert advice, it's easy to make uh, wrong decisions. Um, I always make this example. You know, every time when you seek, you always have people giving suggestions around what concoction you need to put together, whether you meet this and that uh, in order to get better soon. But ultimately, you do need to speak to an expert. Again, if you have a legal problem, you speak to a lawyer. If you have a medical problem, you speak to a doctor. If you want to plan for your future and you need a financial plan in place, speak to a financial advisor. We've also seen uh, the continued growth of uh, polyjobbers. These are people who have more than one income. Um, again, in line with global trends in terms of the gig economy. And we believe this lends itself very well with uh, these basic principles of managing money. So there are three basic things you need to master when it comes to money. The first one is you must know how to make money. Secondly, you must know how to keep money. And thirdly, you must know how to grow money. And that talks to your savings and investment um, plans that you have in place. There are a lot of people who know how to make money, but they cannot keep the money. That's why we've got many people who run out of money a couple of days after payday. I call them payday millionaires. Um, and then, of, of course, there are people who, um, you, who don't know how to grow money. So you can make money, but you cannot grow money. So it's still the same problem as somebody who cannot keep money because you cannot grow your money. And this is why it's important to explore alternative streams of income. But when you do that, make sure that you take care of your primary job. You don't want a situation where you compromise 
your primary job because of your secondary uh, income. But uh, very good trends, uh, very in line with uh, global trends there. 63% uh, growth in terms of stock files. This clearly tells us that the popularity of stock files uh, remain positive and we believe it points to a culture of saving. Again, this challenges the narrative that says South Africa doesn't have a culture of saving. The challenge we have though is that we don't have a mindset of long-term uh, savings and the inst instruments that are available to do so. We know that some of this uh, cash is kept somewhere under the pillow and uh, I'm not going to over elaborate before I get misinterpreted about where people will keep their money. But the reality here is uh, you do need to partner uh, with uh, for, you know, formal, the formal sector, the financial sector, in order to leverage some of the uh, benefits of uh, compound interest. Very, very critical. But we also know that some of these uh, instruments, as particularly with stock funds, it's not just about saving, but it's the easy access to that money because some of them, they borrow uh, from the stock fund and they get charged an interest of up to 50%. Um, which they may be comfortable because then they don't have to go through a lending criteria of uh, formal uh, uh, banks or, or other creditors and so on. All right, moving along uh, on to the sandwich generation. These are people who are looking after their immediate family as well as their extended family. Uh, we're seeing uh, that uh, continue. There is a bit of a, uh, an improvement there. Uh, down from 43% to 39%, but again, clearly showing that people are now realizing that you cannot give what you don't have. And we're seeing a bit of a decline there. But as much as young, a lot of young people, as well as uh, professionals, who are complaining about this phenomenon of uh, being sandwiched, I know the colloquial term is called black tax, but at All Mutual, we prefer to call it the sandwich generation. Uh, I, somebody once said to me, but... Uh, it's still negative because you are still sandwiched. Um, but the point for us here is there is a way around it uh, to deal with the problem of being sandwiched permanently. And the best way to deal with that is to, uh, is to empower your family. Um, you, can, you can help them to start a small business. This could be uh, you know, building some apartments. Um, and you might, be, you might be asking yourself, why am I putting the word apartment and room in the same line. It's because this represents different things to different people. Uh, those who live in suburbs, they call it apartments. But those of us who, are, who come from the townships, we call it rooms. So if I say an apartment to someone uh, in the township, they won't, they, they won't relate. So again, it's really about potentially look at that because demand for accommodation is still very strong. So if you help them and they have a rental income, then it puts less pressure on you to provide financially uh, through your uh, monthly uh, income. So there's definitely different ways that you can support your family to become financially independent. We believe that is a more permanent and long-term solution so that it does not stifle your ability to save and invest. Gambling, um, at 44%, quite concerning. I know it's the first time that we're actually honed in on, on gambling. We're seeing people using gambling uh, as a way to cope or to make ends meet. Uh, whilst one might say, well, I guess people are doing it because perhaps this is one of the few ways or, or the only way that they can cope. We do need to throw caution to the wind because we need to be cautious of the, the dangers of gambling, especially if you've got access to credit. If you've got a credit card and you can apply for personal loan, you can easily gamble with your valuable assets and you might actually even lose your family. I like uh, the work that is being done by the South African Responsible a gambling foundation who have a counseling which they offer to people 24 by 7. And one of the quotes is, winners know when to stop. So for those who are gambling, you do, you do need to explore alternative streams of income, the more reliable ones, and be cautious. And as soon as you see that you are getting to, you are starting to be addicted, um, you need to acknowledge that you may need help as soon as possible. 64% of South Africans saying they don't have a financial advisor. Um, this is certainly one thing that needs to be highlighted. Very, very important. I mean, I think we need to make people understand the importance and the role that a financial advisor play in one's life. Uh, there are three ways in which partnering with an advisor will help you. One is that it will improve the quality 
of your financial decisions. Um, sometimes we think we can do it by ourselves. I mean, we now have a, a, a Google community, people who believe they can Google a solution or almost on anything. But unfortunately, when it comes to financial planning, it's not everything that you can just Google and Google your way out of, this, of the crisis. You do need to find a financial advisor to improve the quality of your financial decision. Secondly, I mean, to plan your future better. Um, you know, I, I said to another group the other day that, you know, we're we are going to be doing an unofficial uh, poll um, in one of the social media platforms where we want to gauge what South Africans think when we ask them, if your future financial self called you, would you pick the call? I'm interested in the answer for that one. And then, of course, uh, to help you to set you on a growth path, you, you do need to speak to a financial advisor because when you know better, you do better. Ah, retirement. I've heard people saying they are going to retire from retirement. You know, it's possible for people to retire from retirement when they suddenly they realize that they didn't save enough for, for retirement. And I think with this whole uh, developing news or, or work happening around the pension fund reform, uh, where people uh, will most likely be able to access their retirement much earlier. A lot of people are excited, but again, there we need to throw caution to the wind that, you know, when you actually start accessing your uh, your retirement, you're actually borrowing from your future. So it's important that you have the now money, but you also have a future money. But when you start mixing the now money and the future money, uh, you, you're going to start having a problem. So it's important for us to understand uh, what our retirement replacement ratio is. And this means um, your, your retirement replacement ratio is about at least 70% of your last paycheck is what you need to be able to buy as annuities through your, your retirement fund in order to maintain the same standard um, of living. There are people who are facing the risk of retiring while they're still paying the bond, while they're still owing the cars. And the problem with that is that when you're earning less, uh, you might have to forego some of your valuable assets. So it's very, very important to plan for the years ahead and a financial advisor can help you to do that. In conclusion, um, I think we've seen the resilience of South Africans. We've seen how creative people can be when they're in a crisis. That's why they say never let a good crisis go to waste. Crisis is not a bad thing at all. It does challenge people to be creative and to find ways to survive. And that's why we're seeing people now switching to uh, loyalty programs. You know, loyalty programs have become the emergency fund. It is certainly not a bad thing to have that because you are, you are saving as you are using those loyalty programs. We're seeing people switching to cheaper uh, supermarket brands, normal, uh, getting married to specific brands because the trolley has wheel alignment and the other one doesn't have wheel alignment. Yeah, you have uh, people, um, you know, the, my most favorite one, by the way, is the one where people are moving children to less expensive schools. Um, yes, there are people who are sticking to these expensive schools even when they cannot afford. Um, my children always correct me because I come from that era. I went to public school throughout my life. So sometimes they correct me. When I say dragon, they say it's not dragon, daddy, it's dragon. But you can't insist on just keeping your children in a private school that you cannot afford just because you want them to say dragon, not dragon. At the end of the day, you can hear what I mean. When it's, dra when it's dragon or dragon, at the end of the day, it is that thing, whether it's there or not. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, ne. Thanks so much, John. Uh, so we've heard quite a lot about the resilience of South Africans uh, from John, from uh, Vuyo as well as a bit from Isak. And so I suppose a, a really nice point to see some of that resilience uh, on the ground. We're going to show you some footage of uh, South Africans and uh, how they have been resilient and what resilience actually looks like in practical terms. I'm working in the company as a supervisor. I'm a woman of three kids. 
basically people call me a hustler because I'm always selling things, I'm always trying to get money from here and there and there. Hey, I like saving money, a lot. I actually found out from a friend about an app where you stash money each and every day. For now, what I'm saving for the future, I'm saving for my kids. I have a life cover. It will give my kids money when I pass away. The way I personally grow up, I don't want them to grow up the way I was. I try very hard because at my age, it's very difficult for you to get a job. Actually, I'm having two stock fails. Every month, we put together some money. So that December time, we don't have to spend a lot in our salaries. What I do, we borrow it and then borrow it out to other people that are not members of the stock fund with a 50% increase. You know, when you have your cash in your account, you just said, okay, that's my money. But in this one, this is a stock fail. It's something that you, like all the women, are equal to fulfill it. Because we also have rules that if ever you don't go through until December, we won't give it to you. I need to have money that I cannot put my hands in, no matter what happens. I think to have a security or discipline to whatever that you need to do in life, it is important. Uh, most certainly, uh, with whatever you want to do uh, in life. Um, these days, I think I'm suffering in the area of discipline when it goes to the gym. But that's not the conversation for today. So uh, questions have come through, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting your responses. So that's great. We've got Isaac there as well. And um, I'm just interested, will you remind us again? So, so when exactly was the survey done this time around? Yep, so it was April to May of 2022. So towards the end of April, 25th of April to the 13th of May. All right, so quite a lot of stuff happened in that time yeah. <laughs> as well. I mean, the, the flooding. Yes, Durban, in, yeah. So that would have been uh, affected in perhaps not much of the heightened load shedding that we're experiencing now, the worst in around two years or so. Because when I looked at the results and I looked at the fact that, you know, South Africans are sticking to this more positive behavior that they developed under the pandemic towards their money, they're saving more, uh, they showing a lot more resilience. I was surprised, and I'm just wondering if you were surprised by the findings yourself as researchers. So we, yes and no. So I think the, the important thing is that we saw the signs of that recovery in 2021. So the need for saving was acknowledged. Actually, the awareness of it was in the 2021 results. Um, you started to see a little bit of those recoveries from 2020 as well, similarly. So the optimism was 61% last year up from about 50%, I think, in, in 2020. So some of that is it's almost the trend or the continuation of the trend. Um, but I do think the fact that it was happening in the midst of you know, the challenges of 2022, I think was, was a, a good surprise um, for us to see. So definitely kind of yes and no, I think, is, right. would be my answer. Okay. Um, and yeah, and I think the, the important thing is, obviously the, re the research is done at a point in time However, there was already, I think, quite a lot happening uh, within the South African context, even up to May. Um, obviously not taking into to account some of the, the newer changes, but one of the reasons we do the, the study annually is to make sure that things can level out. Sure. So you're not just reporting on some of the peaks and troughs, but actually able to report annually. Um, and that's the picture that, that consumers have played back now, is 2021 into a full year into 2022. This is where they are at. Okay, so I mean, this is um, gambling, <laughs> the breaking news in this uh, report, I suppose. And it's something that uh, was highlighted and sort of probed in the uh, staff event that Old Mutual had a little earlier. And uh, funny enough, it's also something that's come through in terms of questions. So I'm going to take uh, the first question from uh, Lundiwe Butelezi from uh, Fin24. My friend, hi, how are you, my friend? Uh, anyway, uh, what she's asking, uh, she's saying that how do you uh, reconcile the data showing that the pandemic has encouraged more people to uh, save just with the desperation that's driving people to gamble, to make ends meet? Um, both of you can take it, but I suppose, John, let me, yeah. let me begin with you and you can add if you have anything to say for you. I think it's it's a uh, it's a uh, it shows that people realize they rea are realizing that they need to do things differently. They realize that they need to up the game in terms of making money, 
uh, they realized that uh, relying on a single income is not a reality anymore that will work for them. And, um, and they're trying to find different ways. Where the challenge is that people are lacking their know-how in terms of making money. So they are looking for quick fixes. That, that's why um, people are you know, risk inclined because they'll rather risk by gambling and looking for possibly even uh, investing in crypto currencies. And I think there are a lot of good examples out there of, um, you know, and I just want to mention my special guest, Mr. Mseluku, who is in our midst, um, who wrote a book about making his first million in informal trading. So there's a whole body of knowledge out there people just don't know. And we actually need to push financial education, create more awareness and explore this so people know that there are better ways, there are better ways of making money rather than just outrightly going for these high risk. Uh, options. All right. But uh, so the tail end to her question, uh, and perhaps you can come in here, Vuyo, is uh, to say, essentially, is the survey showing us that more uh, poor people are getting poorer and that the high income groups are getting richer and saving more? And I think that that is something that you, you touched on in terms of the relationship between financial stress and how much you've got in your, your pocket, but perhaps elaborate yeah. a little bit more. Absolutely. I wouldn't make it as broad as that. I think that that could be true. Um, and we're definitely seeing, obviously, I think, and John spoke to this earlier as well, that your higher income or higher earning individuals had a bigger savings buffer going into the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, the impact was probably slightly less. It was still severe, but just slightly less than your lower income. I think on the question of how do we balance the two, I think both things can be true. So yes, we are starting to see that savings behavior, we're starting to see saving being prioritized amongst spend, but it can also equally be true. And I think, you know, John spoke to this as well on people are looking for ways to get access to money quicker, better returns, et cetera. And that's starting to lead to some risky behavior like the online gambling. All right. um, yeah. And I think to add on that, I mean, we know that whenever there's high inflation, the poor are the hardest hit. Sure, because yeah, most of their money goes to the basic items, food, yeah. transport, mm -hmm. and that's where the inflation pressures are being felt mm -hmm. right now. Okay, one, more, one last question on gambling. This is coming from Nisa. So, so just on the gambling, does this include online, um, the buying of lotto and Powerball tickets via a, a, a banking app? And did the research go that deep? And if yes, do you know the breakdown? Yeah, it did go that deep, so we do have the breakdown, but largely I think Lotto was, Lotto Star is included, but Lotto as in the week, you know, playing it weekly, et cetera, I think was excluded. So it's mainly, and, and one of the things actually around that 44% is people gambling regularly. So it's not just that they're, they're gambling online, but the majority of people are, are gambling regularly, and we can share the list in terms of, it, but it's mainly sports betting and, and um, things like that that would be making up the bulk of that sure. online gambling. Sure, and I think that those of us in the uh, financial space, it actually kind of makes sense, especially if you look at the owners of some of these institutions, uh, and you look at in the absence of tourism having happened as frequently as it did, where they were getting a lot of their money, and they were getting a lot of their money from the uh, gambling side of the business. So I suppose now we have a little bit more color to that story. It's like just to bring you in as well, just as we are talking about risky behavior to, towards money. Um, so crypto deemed risky by some, I suppose it depends on your age group, you know, which year you were born. <laughs> but um, what, what did you say? It was uh, six in 10. Six in 10. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, so six in 10 dabbling in, in, in crypto. And we had news recently that uh, South Africa is looking to, you know, certify crypto finally and make it a financial asset. It's in the pipeline over the next year or so. And I'd, I'm interested in finding out what you think about that and whether this behavior of six in 10 South Africans who are in crypto right now is, is okay in your view? Look, the short answer is it's, it's, it's very speculative. Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, we would, we would advise people to, to really be careful with um, crypto investments. And I mean, you've seen, especially since uh, the start of the year, how, you know, the, the collapse in many of these uh, many of these uh, digital asset prices. Um, so so that should serve as a warning 
um, you know, these things don't just go up. Um, and 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 related, obviously, to the price of like things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. I mean, there's a whole ecosystem that's built on top of that, where you you know there's all kinds of sort of second round of risky behavior. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's fine if people dabble, if they're curious, you know, if they play around. Um, but but that's very different from making this the core of your investment strategy. Um, because ultimately, if you're buying Bitcoin, you hoping that one day you can sell it at a higher price. You're not relying on any kind of underlying income being generated. Uh, it's not the same as buying a bond or buying shares in a company that's going to, you know, generate profits and pay you dividends and so on. All right. So essentially, uh, it needs to be money that you're willing to to lose. And the one or two gray hairs on your head suggest that you're not part of the six in ten. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, another question uh, on retirement reform, and this is something I think the both of you touched on, but we didn't go deep. And I think it's coming from uh, Maya uh, Fisher French. She's saying, uh, John, and perhaps you can start here. Do you think people understand the two pot system and that it will only apply to future contributions, not exiting? Uh, hi, Maya, uh, a good friend of ours, and, and she's spot on. Uh, a lot of people are not aware what this put, put two-part system is about, and I think this is where there's a huge opportunity to partner, especially with labor, um, um, who are obviously are vocal, um, of course, advancing quite rightly so the interests of their members to make sure that they, at least there's some relief uh, in some way. I think it's, it's going to be very important to create awareness about the risks um, as well. And, and also that if people ultimately do access that money, that the money is, is, gets used responsibly. It does expose to people to scams. It does expose people to all sorts of things and even using money for um, non-essential uh, stuff. So we certainly do need to educate people about what it means uh, especially with uh, that applying to future money. But also, I don't think it's going to be huge sums of money. And I think uh, some people might get disappointed when they learn that it's a very small percentage that they can access because ultimately, the retirement fund uh, institutions that are managing this money on behalf of um, fund members, they're not wired to be liquid where the money can be easily accessible because money needs to be invested uh, in different assets in order to create value for fund members for the long term. Mm -hmm. So they'll be disappointed, but you, 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 your research did point out that it's kind of two-way, right? Exactly. People are excited, yeah. some exactly. people are not so. And I'm, as you speak to that, I'm wondering if there's also a difference in perhaps the income groups in terms of where the excitement is coming from uh, for the two-part system and where the, the pessimism is coming from. Yeah, so we, we definitely, so 38% of people were mixed, so that's a combination of negative and, and positive. So there's a big portion of people who are still kind of in two minds. And I think, especially because at the moment it's proposed, so again, to John's point, people aren't clear on what the rules and, you know, what the reform will actually look like. Um, but we definitely saw a skew, I think, based on age, and I think income would have an impact as well, sure. but an age um, skew, and I think we spoke to this on, on people who are potentially more positive, looking at the, the ability to reinvest it in, in, you know, in other ways. And, and those were tend to be younger as well, people. But yeah, but 38% are, are still quite mixed. So I think it's, it's yeah, it remains to be seen. It's probably yeah. something that yeah. people need more information and, and time. Yeah. Understand. When are we getting the final word? Do we know? Ah, it's still on the cards. I think we still uh, a bit, uh, we still need to wait a little bit. Um, but I think what we do need to highlight as well is that, you know, whenever you access your, your future money, that's what we call the future money, that's your retirement money, it will certainly affect your, your retirement uh, your replacement uh, ratio. So meaning that when you retire, the annuity that you get on a monthly basis could be far below what your, what your last pay was to the extent that you, it could compromise the quality of life because then you won't be able to maintain the same standard of living if you don't have adequate uh, savings, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, just, I mean, 
I, it, it was a problem before, I know, historically. Just last question on retirement uh, reform, whereby people would actually quit their jobs in order to access and dip into their, their pension savings, sometimes to make ends meet for a whole host of reasons. I think that sum up to a desperation. And I'm just wondering if we're still seeing that being as prolific as it was in the past based on your encounters with some of your clients? Absolutely. It's still there. And this is why the two-part system is going to help us so that it, it, to, to a large extent, it would discourage people from resigning to access their pension, perhaps to settle their debts and to fund other things. Um, so very, very important that uh, people keep an eye on that, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, it's like in terms of the markets and just, you know, how people can get the most from the markets right now, I know it's a long-term view, you shouldn't be looking at what is happening right now necessarily and uh, panicking, but there's a little bit of panic out out there. I mean, you mentioned a 20% drop uh, from US markets uh, so far this year. I think it's the worst since, 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 19, whatever. Um, so what, what are you telling people right now who are looking at their, their wealth on the markets and who are worried? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the first half of the year was really global markets, the worst, as you said, since, you know, 19 foot sack. Um, Look, I think the key message is is number one, if you're investing for the long term, you know, yeah, what happens now shouldn't really matter that much. Um, I'm talking about someone who has, you know, 20, 30 years to retirement, that's that's okay. Um, the other point is that somewhat ironically, when 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 your current returns are lower, typically your future returns are better. Uh, that's because you know you are now measuring future returns off a lower level. Uh, valuations are better. Um, you know, to give you one example, the 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 U.S. market was trading on a 22 times price earnings ratio, which is very very high. It's historically high. It's now down to 15. It's closer to a long term average. The South African market just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper, and 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 we find that there is this historic relationship between your how cheap you buy, the, you know, how low the price is you buy for something, and how good your longer term returns is. So I think from that point of view. That is a silver lining. I mean, no one likes the volatility. No one likes um, these kind of tough conditions. But but yeah, looking ahead, that does point to better longer term returns from um, from equities. And then on the other hand, you know, people who are more conservative investors who rely on interest rate, interest income, um, you know, for them, it's good news that interest rates are rising globally because you are now getting more options from 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 the bond market, from even money market, bank deposits and so on. You know, uh, rates aren't keeping up with inflation yet. I mean, they're not up at seven and a half percent yet, but they are getting better. I mean, if you think about how low interest rates were, um, you know, just a year or so ago. So so that that would be the, the message for long term investors. Remember that the market is getting cheaper. It's on it's on sale. Uh, you can buy at a discount. That's a good thing for you. Um, and for your more conservative investors who have more immediate needs, you know, they will benefit from from higher interest rates. All right. Yeah, no, no one certainly does like the volatility and even especially us as, as reporters. I mean, we get run out of things to say. Markets up because investors no longer worried about recession. Markets down because investors are worried about recession. It's, it's a headache for us. It's a headache for us also. But I suppose it also does speak to financial education and the importance of a financial advisor, which your survey continues to show that a lot of people don't have. And I'd like to understand what you think the reason for that is, John, because, I mean, not only here as, as Old Mutual empowering us with knowledge about our money to make better decisions, but we have seen a move in the financial services sector to increase the level of financial education, there's a recognition that uh, institutions have been sleeping for a long time. And despite this move, you're still reporting today that around 64% of people don't have a financial advisor. Yeah. What do you think is holding them back? I think uh, we need to recognize the fact that there is a backlog of financial education, not only in South Africa, but across the world. Um, there's a backlog of financial education, and I think if I, if I consider some of the strides we are making to improve uh, financial literacy levels, we've uh, developed uh, high-quality content 
aligned to the curriculum uh, in our schools. And we've been uh, on that journey and we've uh, been sponsoring uh, that type of uh, content uh, in partnership with the Department of Basic Education because we believe that this needs to be targeted at the grassroots level. So we've got a program called Learn Thing Do uh, where we're investing money to help uh, with uh, uh, curriculum recovery, but more importantly, target this area of financial literacy at the school level. Yes, we do need to continue even as an industry uh, to raise levels of financial, but we need to find innovative ways of doing that, not just using conventional methods. And again, this is also explains why we are starting to venture into reality shows where we study educating people about how to uh, protect your inheritance or how to claim when it's been stolen from you. Um, how do you deal with people who blow uh, millions of money in a couple of months? Um, and these are some of the issues that we're starting to grapple, uh, to grapple with and, and we feel the market is receiving it quite positively. All right, okay point taken on the backlog. But opening up the f questions to the uh, members on who are joining us here physically in the room, just raise your hand. Okay, a couple of hands there. So, so if we just take the mic there for now. Um, I suppose brief introduction, your name, and maybe who you are directing your question to specifically, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jan Matlangu. I'm from Organized Labor, COSAT in particular. Two comments I want to make in the question. I think it will be important for Mushal to engage organized labor and talk to them and talk about them because then you miss out the real issues in terms of how their policy proposals are. And we don't have time but I just want to start with the two-port retirement system. It would be nice that at the policy level we engage on that issue moving forward. Here's the reality. A mother in Soe who is a member of retirement fund, we can't talk about what we are raising here when she's going to lose the house. That's the reality. Linked to that, there was a report two months ago that is actually is evening up the number of people who are resigning and retrenchments. It's quite frightening. Why are people resigning? Because not because they're irresponsible to access their, their retirement fund benefits. They are in a crisis. And that's the reality for me we need to deal with. Hence our proposal around the two uh, port retirement system. Of course, I agree with you. It does not address the real issue because it says maybe from next year or whatever, then you must accumulate and then start accessing. I mean, um, it's neither here nor there. But I'm dealing with the reality linking this with uh, entrenchments because people are resigning anyway. Uh, those are realities. South Africans, particularly black workers, are, are facing. So there are these policy issues that you need to engage with each other, not about us. I want to ask the following question. We are saying the 64% people who do not have financial advisors. To what extent are the fees an issue? That, look, um, well, and let me talk about old mutual post, I'm here that these fees are so high, I'm not go I don't need anyone anyway as a financial advisor. That's, that's, a, that's my first question. Linked to that is the 44% gambling. To what extent is your research talking to those with spiritual powers? Um, that I'll make you a millionaire overnight. You must give everything to me. Because those are realities in our society. Ha is your research or findings kind of talking to that? I'll be very interesting, interested in knowing that because that's part of what people are subjected to, which is very unfortunate. Mm, I imagine that kind of data would be quite difficult to uh, collect. No, 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 but uh, let me just make my point and maybe right. but those realities are there. That's why I'm saying we're talking about issues that are in society and they're there. Okay. Can we take your two questions first then, sir? So the one about the financial advice and the fees. Okay. Uh, John, if you stand by there and then yeah. we'll also take yeah. to what degree 
the data looks at gambling. Yeah. I think the good thing about the financial systems and the regulatory environment in South Africa is that we have a, a very robust uh, regulatory regime and with the regulator doing its utmost in partnership with uh, industry uh, to make sure that even the fees are actually regulated. So it's not a fee that is determined by a single uh, financial institution. So in order to even out, uh, to balance the equation, um, that is something that applies across the sector, uh, of course, uh, through consultations and ultimately what the regulator deems to be appropriate at that level. Secondly, the issue of the, uh, and I totally agree with you around the engagement and consultations around policy discussions. And this is why NEDLEC is such a very good forum where all the different stakeholders are, are involved and then basically advancing their views so that we find, collectively find a solution uh, that works for South Africa. Yes, indeed, and, and I, I, you know, one thing I love about labor is the fact that the interest of the worker is of paramount uh, importance, and I think it's something we shouldn't really compromise on. Where the advantage uh, comes in is when we continue with these partnerships where we start educating the worker that there's absolutely no relationship between what you earn and your ability to manage your money. So therefore, we start at a very basic level with imparting principles of managing money, and ultimately, in the long term, we'll be addressing some of these uh, challenges that we see, um, which will also inform uh, some of the policy directions. Right. Thank you. Right, and on, on, on the gambling, so, so, so in my uh, humble view, so I, I, I would uh, regard such behavior whereby you give someone money and you're told that you're going to be a millionaire or they'll make you a millionaire more so as something that's tied to a spiritual belief and I don't know if that spiritual belief falls into the bracket of gambling but would you like to uh, comment just briefly on your, your thoughts to a very real point that you have raised. No, yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, absolutely, very real point. So no, at the moment, our data wouldn't get to that level of, of granularity and it doesn't, we do definitely have a picture of the gambling statistics, looking at people earning between a thousand rand and, and 8,000 rand. And as we mentioned, it's actually even higher, um, the incidence of people gambling online when you look at that subset of people. However, we wouldn't reach the level of granularity of, you know, looking at that interaction between whether you're spiritual or, or, or the language that we use. And I think part of that for me is, is also looking at how much of that is in person um, and would be recorded versus something that's happening, you know, in a, in a personal engagement that someone may not necessarily share, I think is, is, is a big part because I think the, the getting the data in and getting people to actually talk about those practices, I think would be quite hard to do. Um, but it is, yeah, definitely a, a relevant question on, yeah. on the realities. I think it also points to the vulnerability of our people. Mm -hmm. Because come, scams comes in different forms. I mean, whether it comes through a, a spiritual form or whether it, it comes in a form of uh, online dating where you think someone loves you uh, <laughs> and they are, they are quickly, they they are quick, yeah, they're quick yes. to borrow money from you. And in fact, they don't love you. Yeah, you <laughs> might be talking to someone who is definitely not what you see. Uh, and all that. And again, it's, it's a function of us really um, finding ways to sensitize people. I, I know some people even get messages that they, and, and a, rela a relative in, in, in the UK has left an inheritance of, with so many millions of euros, um, but actually there's no such. Sure, sure. Point taken. Uh, so I know the lady sitting next to you also had a question. Okay. Oh, it was, okay, great. Any other questions in the Can I conclude? Room? Can I just ask if there's any other people in the room who want to ask a question, just so we give everyone a fair chance? Yes, no? No? All right. Please conclude, sir. Thank you. On stock fells, you're saying from 2017 there's been an increase. People are taking two to three, you know. What informed that, given the fact that, one, you have a situation where in South Africa about 45% of South Africans are unemployed. And in that cluster of people who are joining this many um, stock fells, linked to that is how do they survive given, you know, they are low incomes. Is about stock fells at all cost, and I will see a better life uh, tomorrow. And lastly, not as a question, I think we need to have a conversation around 
the savings. What are we talking about in the context of the crisis South Africa is, is facing so that we can create something that is sustainable for, for, for all of us? Just to indicate that when I talk about spiritual whatever I said, and that's why I don't believe in that because to the extent that people are told that you'll be a millionaire, it's not true. We have seen that, I think, all of us. And I think these are part of the scams, as we're saying, should be exposed, you know, uh, moving forward because it's taking advantage of vulnerable of people around the society. All Thank right. You. Although I think many of us wish it was true. I mean, I'd love to be a millionaire like that. Uh, but talking to the uh, stock files and maybe getting into the granular yeah. details there. Um, maybe to have a quick comment there. So, uh, and, 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 and this is something my colleague and I were discussing about actually getting below the belly of these uh, uh, stock files as to what incentivizes people to go that route. Because here we're talking about professionals who are degreed um, uh, and, and, and in very senior positions, management positions, we have more than one stock file. Um, I think also we must look at this in the context of again, uh, the positive regulatory regime around uh, ensuring that there's proper governances and, and, and conduct as far as lending is possible, where in terms of the National Credit Act, you cannot advance credit to a consumer who cannot afford, because then that may amount to reckless lending. But then as, as, as banks and, and other credit providers try to put up their scoring system to make sure that they advance credit uh, responsibly, what it does, it does exclude a lot of people who are the working class. Now, what then happens is that then, then people will find creative ways. I'm not saying this is the only reason why people would end up having more than one stock fell, but we do know that uh, a lot of these stock fells do become some kind of uh, lending mechanisms and where they can access that money easier, uh, paying interest of up to 50%. So I think we need to double click on that and understand with a lot more uh, rigor in terms of what happens there, so that we then start looking for solutions to help uh, in that sector. All right, yeah. I hope that answered you. One last question to you, just sorry, in the interest of time, it's about where to from here, uh, the outlook for the next six months. Uh, just, we are resilient, we're saving more, and, and, and. But just given the fact that we are in a cost of living crisis now, we saw inflation at 13 year highs, what does that mean for the next six months, debt serving costs, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's more an ISA question, but I think for, for us definitely right. from a 2023 OMSIM perspective, that will be reflected. So the rest of 2022 would come through um, when we do this again next year. Okay. And so we, I think it will be really interesting to see. But in terms of what next, I think for the next six months, I would probably throw that to you, Isaac. Your crystal ball, what's it saying, Isaac? <laughs> Um, look, it's going to be tough, um, but I think the, the, the good news, if there is any, is if you've already seen global oil prices come down, food prices come down, you know, so, so globally that, that has happened. Locally, we're not feeling the full effect yet because, you know, the RAND has been quite, quite weak. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we probably are over the worst, you know, uh, touch wood, um, as far as this cost of living crisis is, is concerned. So, you know, hopefully we can just all hang in there. And, and when we report back in a year's time, um, it'll be under uh, more auspicious circumstances. All right. We'll take your word for it, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but uh, thanks so much to you. Um, all thanks so much for the engagement in the room, as well as the audience, of course, who have uh, been with us in a really, really busy day. Uh, we're about to wrap up, uh, but before we do, just some final uh, remarks from Old Mutual's Chief Marketing Officer, Musala Phillips. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Musala, as uh, Fifi mentioned. I'm the real uncle that John was talking about. I'm the real uncle to say thank you for taking your time, um, thanks to uh, the media coming through, to key business uh, partners, coming through on this such an important study, and uh, thanks to you, Fifi, as well, for running the program um, so well. Um, and thanks to those also joining us uh, online, and thanks to all the all mutual colleagues and staff uh, coming through. So, very interesting, we had such very powerful and insightful 
uh, insights from the All Mutual Service and Investment Monitor. And we heard from Isaac, and we heard from Vyokas, and we heard from John. And this is a typical half full, half empty situation. You know, there is good things that we're hearing in the economy. There's the bad things that are happening in the economy. We're seeing, uh, Isaac just told us that, hey, food prices has come down a little bit, the oil price has come down a little bit, but we know that a couple of weeks, we just felt petrol prices escalating significantly. We have low shedding, we have all those. Salaries have bounced back, but at the same time, inflation has stolen that um, salary uh, investment. At the same time, you're seeing also what's interesting with um, South Africans is that, as they say, most of them, COVID has got them to think about their money differently and responsibly. And we're seeing people making some interesting choices, right? I can tell you now, in boardroom, there's people in gyms or subscriptions, the likes of Netflix, we have heard how much subscriptions have come down. They're in a crisis mode, the business is going down. But at the same time, there's other people in stock fails who are saying, hey, we've never seen so much money coming through before, right? Um, and as we have seen, with all the advertising and sponsorship of the betting companies, you can see money shifting. For some people, it's good things. For some people, it's bad things. But I think, for me, what excites me more than anything else is seeing the innovation and of what people are doing. There's worrying trends that are in there that are coming through on the gambling piece, going to get 50% uh, interest and, um, on, on loans amongst themselves, right? Is that as financial services um, institution is clearly telling us something that most people have put 8% of the money unbanked, they're getting to gambling and et cetera. It's telling us that potentially what we have as solutions is not meaningful for them, that they are finding other solutions to do that. And that exposes people to high risk, to scams, uh, et cetera. Um, and it's our responsibility to educate people and also make sure that we have solutions that are meaningful. But on top of that, to continue educating people. Because the resilience that you're seeing that's coming through, the innovation that's coming through, is because despite the woes and the nightmare of the economy, people don't ever stop dreaming about a positive future. People don't stop dreaming about giving the best education for their kids. And that's what's amazing about this country, what you're seeing is that people never stop dreaming. And they will do all they need to do to achieve uh, what's best for them. And as all mutual, our role is to really be a trusted financial partner to champion positive futures, to enable people to do great things every day. And the question is why we're doing this study that we've been doing for 2009 is because we know that when you know better, you do better. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Musala. We'll make that the last word. Uh, thanks uh, once again uh, to everyone, uh, the, my fellow colleagues in the media industry, uh, for your time. Uh, again, a reminder, if you uh, want the report, all the information, check out the uh, website, www.oldmutual forward slash uh, savings monitor. It will all be there, as well as the recording to uh, the session. But uh, with that said, have a great day further, and bye for now. Um, I'm a social media specialist, I'm a rapper. I run a small business. The reason I just, uh, resigned from my day job was that the Euro transition, and obviously with COVID happening and the kind of bigger gap with Iran and the Euro, it was a lot more lucrative for me. I'm a hustler, I need more money, and I do need to have different source of incomes, you know. I like to take calculated risk. I'm not a financially savvy person necessarily. Um, investment performance is a very important investment itself. For me, it was a case of going, I've got a bit of expendable income, I don't want to you know, put it all into the sneaker collection. At this moment, I'm trying easy equities, I'm trying to invest in stock, but I'm looking for more like crypto. So I've never taken profits on crypto. I've just kept returning, kept adding to it. If I've done work where I've earned crypto abroad, it's more of a long haul and see where it goes and let it grow that way. And it's performance, man. The stats, numbers never lie. I do tend to like to spread things around a little. The markets that I tap in into like the influencer market, sometimes you get the gigs, sometimes you don't get the gigs, you know. I've got no problem with traditional investment. Um, it's Betway and Hollywood bets, soccer mostly. It's nice to have that weekend gambling money, so to say, to use for more sort of high risk, future forward. Yeah.
kind of investments. There's people that I bet with, they do get tickets like tennis and all of that stuff. The monies that are coming through will never be enough. It makes it dangerous gambling, you know. Soccer is back next month, so yeah, man, I'm back.